When I was a pastoral ministry intern living and working in Boston, I took the tea from my apartment to my church on Sunday mornings. I had both the blessing and the curse of living at the very end of the notoriously slow green line, which meant that the good news was that I always got a seat on the train, but the bad news was that I had to sit there for what felt like a very long time. On my Sunday morning train rides, I wore my typical church outfit at that point in my life, a pair of jeans, a plaid flannel button-down shirt, waterproof boots, and a hat. If it was winter, I wore my warmest hat and my ski gloves and three, four, maybe five pair of socks. The reason for me being so casual was that, as many of you know, the church that I was a part of at that time in my life worshipped outside 52 Sundays a year, rain or snow or heat wave. We did this because our congregation was homeless. They lived on the streets, and so the streets were where we worshipped. On top of my casual church outfit, I tied around my neck, oh my goodness, it's supposed to be out. I wanted y'all to see it. (laughs) I tied around my neck this simple bronze metal cross hanging from a very simple piece of brown cord. The cross had been a gift to me when I was commissioned as the church's intern, and all of the members of the church wore identical ones. These bronze crosses were our symbol, a sign that we were all one in Jesus and united through the homeless church. I wore and I wear my cross with gratitude, really aware of how undeserving I was in all of my privilege to be offered such hospitality from a community that was so marginalized. At the same time, I also wore my cross with some self-consciousness, particularly on the train when I found myself squeezed into such close proximity with Boston's general public. Men carrying $200 backpacks, women catching up on the latest liberal book club book, virtually everyone carrying an iPhone. I felt hyper aware of the cross that I was wearing around my neck and any glances that it received. For one, the large, clunky religious symbol wasn't exactly a stylish piece of jewelry amongst the undergrads and 20-somethings who shared my commute. I looked a bit weird, but it was more than that. I was aware that I carried with me a powerful and conspicuous symbol for God. It's not that I believed that this necklace was magical or anything like that. I didn't think that God was any more present with me when I was wearing it compared to when I wasn't. But I knew that the symbol drew attention to itself and thus to me. And I felt, more so than on a normal day, that I was representing Christ. Riding that train with the cross around my neck, I suddenly became aware of how un-Christ-like some of my behavior was. Sometimes a person who clearly needed a seat more than I would board the train when it was very crowded but I didn't stand up and offer my seat for no better reason than I didn't feel like it. Sometimes I was tired. Sometimes I didn't feel like engaging with another human being. Maybe I was just thinking, no one else is getting up. Why should I? It was a minor sin, definitely. But nonetheless, it was an act of selfishness. The presence of the cross around my neck had a way of magnifying my sin, especially those small sins 
that I wouldn't even normally think about. It had a way of making me aware of the ways that I was failing to be the kind of person that God had created and called me to be. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, when the Ark of the Covenant rolls into the Israelite station, the Ark magnifies all of the ways that David is far from the righteous and godly king that God has called him to be. David has just become king over all of Israel. Like any new leader during his first 100 days on the throne, David has been getting his royal priorities in order. First, he conquers a foreign city and names it after himself, obviously, who else? Jerusalem, the city of David. After all, as a new king, one has to have someplace suitable to set up one's royal throne. Second, David celebrates his power by surrounding his throne with beautiful women. A few wives here, a few concubines there. Really, can one have too many? Third, and finally, David commands his army to attack the Philistines. In effect, capturing and bringing back home to the Israelites their most prized possession, the Ark of the Covenant. Like I was telling the kids, the Ark was essentially a golden box that held the stone tablets of God's law. But the Ark wasn't just a fancy box. It was at that time in the history of God's relationship with humanity, God's dwelling place on earth. The Ark of the Covenant was the real and present manifestation of God's spirit. Therefore, when David captured the Ark and brought it home, he was returning not just a piece of property— but he was also returning God back to the center of Israel's life as a community. The irony here is that the law, the stone tablets in the ark, contained the Ten Commandments, a number of which David had broken, was breaking, and would continue to break, during his life as the king of Israel. The irony in today's scripture passage is that David parades in triumph as God's chosen king with the precise item that indicts him as unfit for godly service. The Bathsheba incident? Pretty sure that was adultery. Conquering Jerusalem, pretty sure that's a double whammy of commandment 8, stealing, and commandment 10, coveting. Waging war against the Philistines, yes, that is considered murder. And naming a city after yourself definitely borders on idolatry. The presence of the ark, the presence of the Most High God brings to light all of David's sin. God's presence has a way of pointing out all of the ways that David is missing the mark as a king and as a man. There's something, beloved, about the presence of God that has a way of shining a light on our human sin. To this day, I remember the first time that I actively, knowingly committed a major sin. I was about six, and I loved Barbie. There was a small finished attic space in our home, accessible only through my bedroom. So it was almost like a secret hideout. And that's where I kept my Barbies. I had Barbie and Ken and some of Barbie's friends. I had a Barbie car and a Barbie house. 
I even put up a homemade sign on the door that said in bright pink crayon, Barbie Land. When my friends came over, I obviously wanted to show Barbie Land to them. We would play for hours, styling Barbie's hair, playing Barbie school, and throwing Barbie weddings. One day, a friend came over. And we were deep in some kind of Barbie role play when we realized that we needed another doll in order to successfully act out whatever it it was that we were pretending. I said to my friend, well, I, I do know where my mom keeps the birthday presents. Huh? She said. The birthday presents. My mom keeps a a stash of small toys for me to take as gifts to my friend's birthday parties. It's just right outside my bedroom in the hall closet. We tiptoed out of my bedroom, opened the closet door, and there it was in plain sight. A brand new Barbie doll encased in a plastic box with glossy pink cardboard backing. Her shiny blonde hair glistened. She would be perfect. Let's take her, my friend said, and I agreed. And so we did. When my mom found us later playing with the stolen Barbie, she seemed surprised and disappointed. Michelle, where did you get that Barbie? I lied. Well, you see, the package got ripped, and so we couldn't have really given it as a gift anymore, and so I just figured that it would be best to open up and use it so that it wouldn't go to waste. I was trying to be sneaky, but Of course, my mom saw through the whole thing. She put me in time out to think about what I had done. And it was there in time out when I was finally still and quiet that I knew that not only was what I had done wrong, I also felt really, really sorry that I had done it. In that moment, God was with me. God, of course, was also with me when I stole the Barbie and then when I lied about it. But when I went to time out, I was aware that God was with me. And when I was aware of God's presence, I felt a sense of conviction, a sense of regret. Beloved God is always with us. Like Psalm 139 says, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. God's presence is always with us. But sometimes we need a timeout or a cross or a church service or an ark to remind us that God is there. And when we remember that God is there, God's perfect presence has a way of illuminating the ways in which we need to turn from our sin and change in order to more fully become the people that God has created us and called us to be. In our scripture lesson, David dances before God. But this isn't the innocent dance of a child. David's dance 
is the dance of a man who knows that in the presence of the living God, God's grace is greater than all of his shortcomings as king. God's grace is greater than David's sin. And that, beloved, is a cause for celebration. If you read the chapters surrounding this passage in 1st and 2nd Samuel, if you read the verses in the middle of the passage that the lectionary cuts out, it is a mess. There's murder, greed, pride, jealousy, adultery, vindictiveness. And in the middle of all that mess, David dances. The presence of God returned to God's kingdom and the Ark of the Covenant illuminates David's sin. Yes, and sin is hard to face. But it's only when David has his sin brought to light that he can truly receive and celebrate the freedom of God's grace and forgiveness. David dances because, as the scriptures tell us in the book of Nehemiah, the joy of the Lord is his strength. The joy of God's grace is so profound on that day that David creates a national holiday to commemorate it. Each year, the Israelites will reenact 2 Samuel chapter 6, they will reenact the day that the Ark of the Covenant returned home with dancing and singing. They will actively choose to remember that no matter what mess is going on in their lives or their nation, that God is with them and that God's grace is far greater than all of the mess that they are in. Like the ancient Israelites, we too, as contemporary Christians, have regularly scheduled times and seasons to actively remember God's presence with us. On Christmas, we remember and reenact God becoming a human being to dwell amongst us. On Easter, we remember and reenact the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And every Sunday is an opportunity to pause, to remember, and to celebrate that God is with us. The presence of the living God is in our midst. And yes, God does call us to confess our sins. But the reason we have confession isn't for God's sake. It's for our sake so that we can be freed to receive the grace that is greater than all of our sin. So that we can experience true and unbridled joy. So that we too can dance like David. Arguably, some of the best photos from my and John's wedding aren't of us, but they're of my grandmother. Particularly, they're photos of my grandmother, who I call Grammy, dancing with my grandfather at our wedding reception, having what she later repeatedly told me was the best day of her life. Beloved, the most joyful dance comes not from the young bride who has yet to weather the storms of life and marriage. It comes not from the person who hasn't yet made a million mistakes, from the person who is putting their best foot forward still. The most joyful dance comes from the woman who has weathered a marriage of over 60 years who has made plenty of mistakes and messes along the way, who has experienced the kind of love that triumphs even in the midst of life's greatest challenges and pain. 
the most joyful dance comes from the one who has messed up and known forgiveness. From the one who knows that even, or perhaps especially, when you have weathered the storms and mistakes of life, that in the end, love and grace win. Thanks be to God. Amen.